Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you back. And I'll just go through a couple of slides. If you if you need to reset your password, uh, you can do it in info at cultural heritage. If you have questions and you have been contacting me, use this email. And um, if you have questions about course content, use the course discussion. And remember, to receive a Credly badge for this course, you need to listen to all the webinars and complete the assignment. And you'll have until November 8th to complete everything. Um, and after that, I will issue the assignment. And um, if you have questions about caring for your collections, you can post them in the Connecting to Collections Care community. Um, I, I, ooh, I, I, um, and coming up, we have two webinars, um, one on facility planning and one on lighting. I'm sorry, there's an echo. Um, and also, I wanted to just tell you about your, when you submit your assignments, please try to submit them as one document. And, um, and, and you can do it as a PDF or a, a, a Word document. And if they're too large, you may have to make them smaller. So I'm now going to turn this over to Gretchen. Hi. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Oh, there is echo. Uh, I hope that everybody is working on the assignment and get them to me as soon as you can. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with the grading. Let me introduce Tara Kennedy, who is going to be your lecturer for today. And Tara, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, it doesn't seem like I'm echoing, so that's good. <laughs> um, so I'm waiting for the slides to pop up. Ah, there I am. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Tara Kennedy. I'm the preventive conservator uh, at Yale University Library. And I'm here to talk to you all today about um, housekeeping and mold in collections. So um, I'm going to go over just what we're going to talk about today so you know what to expect. So one of the first things we're going to talk about is what is mold? How did it get where it is? What triggers it to grow and spread? What type of damage can it do to your collections? And what is that other white stuff you're saying that might not actually be mold? It's always good to identify it. Um, and if it's not really a problem, then you don't have to worry about it. Secondly, we're going to talk about what you can do about mold. Uh, which, uh, which mitigation strategies work best to tackle the problem? We'll look at the 10 agents of deterioration as discussed in your previous lectures with Gretchen to see what preventive actions you can take in order to prevent mold from growing and spreading in your collections. And we'll also talk about what you can do when what you can handle in a small to mid-sized institution and when you really need to call the big guns to help, such as a conservator, or a disaster remediation contractor. And most importantly, or I think is most important, um, we're going to talk about health and safety when dealing with mold. What precautions should you take when you're working with mold? I'll talk about personal protective equipment, or PPE, that you will need to ensure your, that your health and safety, as well as those who are working around you. So what is mold? Mold is everywhere. It's a ubiquitous thing that's found indoors and outdoors. They're part of our environment, and actually they play an important role in our ecosystem. Molds exist to digest dead plant and animal matter. 
So they're like nature's little garbage disposals that digest and break down organic matter. So actually what's interesting about mold is it's not an animal, it's not a vegetable, and it's definitely not a mineral. It's in a class all by itself. It's in the kingdom of fungi or fungi. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. You decide. And whether it's called mold, fungi, or fungi, or mildew, it's all the same thing, what you see on your slide there. So that's mold growing in a petri dish, and that's actually from just taking a sample outside in rural New Mexico, one of, one of the driest places you can be. Um, and uh, you still can see that there's mold spores that can be activated, incubated, and made to grow, even in the driest of climates, so it's everywhere. So what we're most concerned about as collection care professionals is what's called SAC fungi, a class of slime mold. I know, really appetizing, right? I hope you all aren't eating lunch. Uh, so the canidia from these molds, like aspergillus, which you see on your slide there, and penicillium, which is actually where penicillin comes from, this canidia are released into the air, and the canidia, or spores, you can call them that as well, are carried by wind, water, and other living beings. And they are asexual, which means they can reproduce all by themselves without needing to be fertilized, which is why they can grow in abundance everywhere. And so that's why removal of mold spores, in other words, cleaning, is so important. If there aren't any spores there, the mold can't spread. So I just list a couple of examples of kinds of mold. Aspergillus, uh, which is the slide you see there. Um, by the way, molds can be very pretty under the microscope, especially when you stain them and you, and you look at them under the microscope, as you see there. Um, Aspergillus is a pretty common species of mold. Uh, penicillium is where we actually get penicillin, an antibiotic from. And it's also the mold that grows on blue cheese. And then there's the evil Stachybotrys, otherwise known as the toxic black mold that you probably have heard about um, in hysterical newscasts or on the internet. So as I, to continue, um, the canidia and spores are specifically designed for survival. They will only grow and propagate where they have a chance of survival which means they need the right food and the right environment. The thing about spores or canidia, they have really thick cell walls that must be penetrated in order to fully kill them. So dormant spores can survive extreme environments. That can be freezing, that can be really dry conditions and really hot conditions, etc. So dormant canidia must remain viable, can remain viable for over 20 years just waiting for the right environment to germinate, which is why, again, removal is the best way to get rid of mold and prevent it from reproducing in the first place. That's why cleaning is so important. So what does mold look like? You've probably seen things like this. These are some books that were left by um, in a moist environment and mold was allowed to grow. So when it's active, mold can look, can look sort of soft, spidery, squishy, fuzzy, velvety. It has a surface texture often that's like wispy cotton. And especially under a microscope, you can see this. And what you're seeing is what's called the mycelium. They're thin branches of hyphae that are the vegetative state of the mold. So that highly branched mycelia that's forming are present to help in the decomposition process that the mold is performing. So it's actively digesting whatever food source it is glommed onto. So that's what you're seeing. That's what's happening when you're seeing that kind of mold on objects. It's feasting away at the organic materials. So if mold can be active and inactive. So your active mold is what I previously described. It's sort of that squishy, spongy, fluffy sort of look. Um, and inactive mold tends to be dry and powdery and dusty. And that's the desiccated spores and hyphae that you're seeing there. 
it's important that you get rid of both kinds as both are a risk to your collections and to your health and to the health of your staff and your patrons. So mold comes in a variety of fashion colors. Um, and color actually is not indicative to what kind of species it is. In other words, if you happen to see mold that's colored black, it doesn't mean that it's inherently toxic. It doesn't mean that it's stachybotrys. It just means that mold happens to emit a, uh, a black or a dark gray color. And most mold I've seen over the years in collections range from anything from white to green to gray. And this lovely example here is it has a wide variety of colors. And incidentally, the colors that you're seeing that the mold is leaving behind on objects um, is sometimes it's uh, called melanin, like the uh, same material that um, creates like the darkness of your skin. Um, it's left behind by the spores to help protect the mold from rival molds, UV light, temperature extremes, and free radicals. So it's actually some used as a shield. It's not just for fashion anymore. So where, where can you find mold? So mold, as I mentioned before, mold needs the correct food, usually an organic source, and environment to thrive. So here's where the 10 agents of deterioration come in. Mold needs water or high relative humidity and pollutants to germinate. High temperatures can help mold to thrive, but it is not necessary for mold to grow. So, I mean, a perfect example is food can go moldy in your refrigerator, and it's certainly not high temperatures in there. And when I say pollutants, what I'm referring to mostly is dust and dirt. Surfaces that are dusty and dirty are where mold's going to grow first. So seeing where the mold has come from in its original context is often very helpful in identifying mold. Uh, so in the example I'm showing you here, we see that mold is growing only on the surface of the box where dust and dirt would have gathered over the years. Dust and dirt can contain mold spores, but it also can contain food for mold spores, like dead skin cells that have been sloughed off us humans. And when moisture is added to the mix, we have germination. And here's another example about where mold might grow. It can be selective in where it's going to germinate. So here we see it growing on a starch-filled cloth that was used to assemble the pamphlet binder. It is also only growing on the exposed part of the book, the part that was exposed to the air. So in this particular example, this mold outbreak was caused due to mold growth inside of an air handler, which was spitting mold spores out into the library. So it was in line of fire with the air handler and the air spouting out of the supply vent. And also it had a ready source of organic food in the starch filled cloth that was exposed to the air um, from the, that part of the book sticking out of the shelf. You'll often see also mold growth on water damaged materials um, enclosed containers that can seal in moisture. This is a really good example. This is what um, has been called, a, I think, a magnetic photo album, um, the kind that have adhesive on the pages and you just stick the photographs and then put the plastic back over it to protect the surface of the photos. So the plastic sheeting was a great way to seal in the moisture and then it allowed the mold to grow in there because it had a nice moist environment in which to grow. So what does mold do to collections? And as I mentioned, mold is, exists in the world to break down organics, usually dead plants, dead animals, that sort of thing. So when it's um, forming on your organic materials, it's breaking down and digesting organic materials, just like it would leaf debris in the woods that it would find. So when it starts to germinate on organic materials like paper, 
it will break down and actually digest the object. So here's an example I'm showing at this corner that got uh, moisture damage and mold damage where the mold actually digested the paper. So, so mold can actually weaken and actually break down paper and other organic materials, even to the point where there is loss, as in this example here. Here's another example. Um, so this is a paper sleeve from, uh, from an acetate record, again, left in a damp environment. And you can see the little holes, discoloration, and tide lining. They had water. It had probably dust and dirt there. It also had the organic material of the paper. Everything was ready and perfect environment for uh, the mold to thrive, grow, and eat away at the paper. You can also, um, mold can also uh, do some staining and discoloration uh, damage as well. This is a horrific example of mold growing on a pastel drawing. And it actually was recovered. They, um, the conservator who worked on this was able to actually remove the mold to reveal the painting again. But this is a really extreme example of what kind of mold, uh, what kind of damage mold can do to our collections. There probably was some residual mold damage underneath, but if they caught it in time, um, it might not have digested much of the paper, we can hope. So what is not mold? So here's one that happens a lot, um, especially where I work. People call me and they say, oh, we have mold on our books. And a lot of the times I look at the pictures or I'll go into the collections and see the items and I find that it's actually not mold. It's what's called fatty spew. It can be spelled S-P-U-E. It can be spelled S-P-E-W. I'm not sure of the spelling, but I can tell you what it is. Um, so it's often found on leather objects that have been exposed to the air. Um, often it's seen on the spine of books, um, leather items, um, anything, actually anything made of leather. Um, and the thing about it that makes it very distinctive from mold is that it has a very definitive crystalline looking structure that rises to the surface of the leather. And actually this next slide, you're going to see it a lot better. It's going to look like little... Um, crystalline snowflakes. They look like tiny snowflakes or ice crystals. Um, so what's happening, it, conservators theorize, is that a lot of leather materials have been treated over the years uh, with different types of oils. Um, yes, it is also called fatty bloom or leather bloom. That is another name for it. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, and What's happening is oils and other things have been used over the years to treat leather materials. And, and they think that that's what's happening when air somehow is exposed to, the leather item is exposed to air, it is somehow coming out as this sort of efflorescent crystalline structure. Because um, if you actually touch it, it feels like wax. It feels like, um, yeah, like it, just, it feels like wax. And it's absolutely harmless. So all you need to do is remove it with a soft cloth and then you need to house the object to protect it from the air and it shouldn't return. But it actually won't hurt the object and it won't hurt you. So that's the good news. So what are some early signs that you might have a mold problem? Moisture sources is an obvious one. Mold starts to grow, <coughs> excuse me, around um, 48 to 72 hours after an incident involving high moisture and on hot, humid days and when there's been floods or leaking or anything like that. Um, the presence of insects is often also another indicator. Uh, some pests like silverfish and book lice, which are really, really tiny. You're seeing this picture you're seeing of this book louse is at very high magnification. It's millimeters big. Uh, they eat mold as a food source, and they're often attracted to moisture and wet areas, especially silverfish, millipedes, any sort of high active insect act activity is an indicator. 
And there's that telltale musty odor that we're all familiar with. It smells damp, musty, and earthy. Uh, smells up like a closed up basement, essentially. Um, and incidentally, what you're smelling um, are the volatile organic compounds that the mold is releasing as it multiplies and grows. Yuck. Yes. <laughs> So if you do think that you have a mold problem, it's really important to do a thorough inspection in the space to see where that smell is coming from, um, especially if you've, had, if you've had a water incident, if you're noticing a lot of more um, insects or pests in an area. Um, it's really good to take a look around and see where this might be coming from. Um, we sometimes call them microenvironments, where there's um, environments in small, tight spaces where moisture may have been trapped and you don't even know it's happening. Uh, behind shelves, especially where air circulation is prevented. Basement floor storage and cardboard boxes is another one. Uh, damp microenvironments do the location of water, like if you're near, it's locations near sinks, near bathrooms, um, anything where there's might be condensation, uh, window sills where there are no leaks, um, or places where uh, post-water incidents where the drying did not take place immediately. You may have dried it 42 to seven, 48 to 72 hours later, and you find out like, oh, there's actually mold growing here because there was enough time for the mold to actually propagate. So what's important um, for mold prevention is reducing and removing moisture. That's a huge part of making sure that mold doesn't have the chance to germinate. Uh, so what helps is not storing collections in damp areas, especially the basement um, or places that you know tend to leak or near bathrooms or things like that. Uh, you want to keep your relative humidity as low as you can, 55% um, RH um, and as low as 30% in that range is what we like to see for collection storage unless it's something that's particularly sensitive to particular relative humidities, then you might have to create some, a microenvironment to protect that object. But for general, generally speaking, 30 to 50, 55% RH is what we like to see. And it doesn't have to be a flat line. It can be you know, soft changes or gradual changes, I should say, within that range is acceptable. You want to ensure air circulation around collections. Again, it's that microenvironment where there's still moist air that gets trapped. It's a great environment for mold to grow. And respond quickly to water damage. You want to make sure that if there is a water incident in your space, that you clean up the water as soon as possible. So one thing to know about a lot of collections, especially organic collections, is materials can hold a lot more water, um, hygroscopic materials can hold a lot more water than one would suspect, uh, paper especially. Uh, so this is a really great image of uh, showing that. It's an image from a water emergency in the Australian National University's Chifley Library. When books absorb water, they swell and increase in size, <laughs> causing uh, fun sculptures like this to appear on your shelves. So it's basically restricting the books couldn't go anywhere as they as they uh, absorb water. So they kind of push themselves up into that that sort of a ridge like structure. So it's important to recognize that that um, you may not see any standing water, but the object may have absorbed the moisture uh, itself. Other tips for mold prevention: uh, regularly changing air handle, air handling, air handler filters is really important, and cleaning your ductwork if you've had a major outbreak. I usually look to have air handler filters changed quarterly or seasonally. That usually works pretty well unless you have an active problem. Isolate and examine incoming collections. This is really important um, to prevent 
potential mold infestations, but it's also important in case you might have a collection coming in that could have an insect infestation as well. So it's good to have a separate space in your, uh, in your cultural institution, and that space can be a room, that space can be a cabinet, uh, where you have new collections to come in that can be observed over time to make sure that there isn't any sort of active mold or insect infestation. And what this course is all about, regular housekeeping to make sure you keep your shelves and other surfaces free of dust. If you have a clean environment, the dormant molds, mold spores will be removed with regular dusting and cleaning and not giving them the chance to activate and germinate. So that's what we really are looking to do. Um, Swiffer cloths, Swiffer brand cloths and microfiber cloths were great for dusting, um, including the ones, the Swiffers that have look like they're feather dusters. Those work really well. HEPA filtered vacuums are also uh, recommended because that means the mold will be kept inside the vacuum and not be spit out of the back of the vacuum or all over the room. And it's really the only type of vacuum you should use, especially to clean mold. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the health hazards surrounding mold. And I, am, I have this underlined. All molds pose a health risk, all of them. And I say that because it's not necessarily dependent on the mold, but more dependent on the person exposed to the mold. Some people are just naturally more at risk than others. So usually the range for sensitivity to mold can be anything from a sensitizer, like it makes your eyes itchy or your nose can run, which it can then become an allergen and then later can become toxic. And so it is truly depend person dependent more than mold dependent. Um, so those who might be more at risk for um, mold issues would be those with compromised immune systems, anybody who has an existing respiratory illness or your asthma, anyone who's allergic to mold, mushrooms, people who are allergic to penicillin because that's made from mold, things like that. So it's best to assume that all mold is a health risk. So that way you will always protect yourself and others. And as I mentioned before, there are some molds that are just inherently toxic, like Stachybotrys, the black mold. Um, the only way you'll know what kind of mold you're dealing with is to have them tested. Um, but the one thing about Stachybotrys that I can tell you is it is a toxic variant of mold, but it usually grows on construction materials, especially sheetrock. So it's not something you're going to necessarily find in your collections. I'm not saying you never would, but it's highly unlikely. Um, and the only way you can know if your mold you're dealing with is toxic is to get all of the mold tested. And that can be taking many samples um, and be expensive and time consuming. That's sort of why I tell people it's just best to assume that all mold is a health risk um, because then you just take proper precautions with protective personal equipment rather than spending tons of money on identifying your mold. Um, it's just not something that is necessarily going to help you in the long run unless you have a really stubborn long-term problem that you cannot remedy. Then that might be warranted, but certainly not right off the bat. So what can you do about mold? So like a large outbreak, say like a room full of books, you're going to want to call in the big guns. And that would be a conservator who can then recommend what next steps you can take. I wouldn't immediately call a disaster recovery company without the advice of a conservator because disaster companies often don't know what to do with cultural heritage objects. They're mostly used to dealing with people's couches and rugs things that are generally replaceable in most cases. And insurance. Again, if it's a large outbreak, insurance may be able to cover it dependent upon what the ultimate cause of the outbreak was and what your policy will cover. So now would be a good time to check that collections insurance policy to see what it covers. But these are gonna be the five steps one should take 
in response to a mold outbreak, whether it be a small outbreak or a large outbreak. We've got, we want to confine the outbreak. We want to stop the growth of the mold. We want to kill the active mold growth if we can. Remove the mold from the object of the space. And then we want to take steps to prevent reinfestation. So, but before you do anything, the first thing you have to do is protect yourself. This is super, super important. Um, so this is a sampling of the kinds of equipment, uh, professional protective equipment that you should have on hand. Um, just to even, even if you're going to be dealing with even just a water emergency or anything like that, a lot of this would be helpful too. Uh, gloves, you can have nitrile um, for people who are allergic to latex uh, for handling collections. Masks, you can have full or half face respirators, which require fit testing. Um, or you can have N95 particulate respirators, which are disposable respirators that you can purchase. Uh, unvented goggles to prevent any mold spores from getting into your eyes. Protective clothing, uh, you can have Tyvek coveralls like the example in the picture there, so they kind of look like space aliens. Um, you, or you can do, at least at a minimum, aprons or lab coats. And people often have told me in a disaster situation is that a bonnet or a cap to protect your hair um, from carrying the mold home mostly is a good idea as well. So if you have... Um, any sort of, I'm just going to say this, any sort of respiratory ailment, even asthma, before you wear an N95 particulate respirator or any sort of mask that's going to restrict your um, breathing, um, restrict your breathing, not exactly, restrict your airflow, you want to talk to a doctor to make sure that you're able to wear it safely. Okay, but now I'm going to go into my, my tirade about... <laughs> about what's a dust mask, what's a medical face mask, and what's a respirator. Um, this is something I have to do a lot, and um, it's something I see that's um, a mistake people make often, and it's, it's they're doing things that are not protecting themselves, and I want to make sure that everyone understands how important it is to protect your respiratory health when dealing with mold. So what you're seeing here are two examples of masks I've seen that people wear when they're doing mold recovery, solvent work, all sorts of other things. Um, neither of these are useful for those applications. Uh, dust masks, like the woman on your left in the green shirt, uh, does not provide a good enough seal, and it doesn't filter out small enough particles of mold. So it's not going to protect you. It'll protect you a little bit, but not enough. And medical masks, like the woman on the right in the blue, uh, that's actually to prevent you from spreading germs to others and not the reverse. So definitely don't use these. Instead, use this. So a couple key points that you're going to want to look for in order to be know what is a respirator versus a dust mask or a medical face mask. The respirator will often have the information written right on it, as I've indicated with the circle there. It says, uh, no, I think it's a NOSHA N95 that it says there. And it has two straps. That's a really, um, a really big, a good indicator that this is a respirator. And here I will show you my pet peeve. My biggest pet peeve with people wearing respirators. Mm -hmm. And I see them all the time in news articles and, um, different coverage when people are covering uh, disasters. These people are wearing N95 respirators, besides the fact that they don't fit them very well. They're only using one strap. You can see the other strap is dangling from them, dangling from like their chins. So um, if you, um, so I really mean it is important that you use both straps. <laughs> Please use both straps. Do this. <laughs> and somebody's laughing because yes I get really annoyed by this because it's you're wearing something you have like like you've almost got it like you you understand that you need to protect yourself but you didn't 
quite get the whole memo. It's like, no. And actually to create that seal that works well to protect you from the mold, you need to wear both straps. So please wear both straps. Thank you. That has been my public service announcement for the day. Okay, so back to dealing with the mold. So first, you want to confine the outbreak. So for smaller incidents, you can isolate affected, affected objects. Um, if the items are moldy but not wet, you can place them in zip-top style bags. And if they're wet, wrap them in wax or butcher paper so they don't stick. And move the collections to a space that's not affected by mold. Ah, yes. So I see, I'm sorry, just to go back, I see a question or a comment by uh, someone who says that a doctor recommends, a doctor whose name I'm not familiar with, recommends that masks be specially fitted for you, especially if you're on disaster response teams. That is true. In that case, if it's something that's part of your day-to-day -day job, I would definitely recommend getting fit tested by a certified industrial hygienist. I'm thinking of times when it's not something that's in part of your regular job um, or an emergency incident where you have to go into a space and it's better than nothing. You have something that's protecting you. Actually, um, something I forgot to add to my list of um, recommended readings and such is there's a particular um, disposable uh, respirator that fits more faces than others very well. So I'm going to need to, if I can ask Susan or Gretchen to send that link to you all, I will um, dig that up and make sure that you all get that particular style of mask. I find it works very well when I have to uh, fit folks um, when they're working on different in different spaces here in the lab. Uh, I find it fits a lot of different face shapes, so I will add that. I'll post the link for the masks and the handouts. Thank you, Susan. Yay. Okay. And I wrote myself a note. Hopefully, I'll remember. Okay. So, back to confining the outbreak. Ah, Dr. Trinkley's. Oh, the Shakura Foundation. Cool. Okay. Now I know who Dr. Trinkley is. Awesome. Yes, actually, uh, that's one of the websites I use to uh, create this presentation. So, yay. Thank you. Now I've learned a thing. <laughs> Thank you for telling me who that is. All right, so for smaller incidents, there's this. For larger incidents, you want to uh, isolate the area overall. You can use thick sheet plastic and duct tape to isolate the space to ensure that the mold doesn't spread to other areas. And this is something also that a disaster recovery group, uh, excuse me, company might do for you. They can actually create these isolated areas with like zipper entrances that work really well for containments. Um, and you want to create negative pressure. So that includes shutting down any air handling vents that might return air from that area. Uh, large sheet magnets actually work really well to cover air ducts. If you can't get it to shut off, it at least will keep it from getting sucked up into the air handler. So that's something that's uh, a good tip to have for that. So you want to stop the growth. So for small incidents, you can actually, <laughs> you can freeze dry, or it's also called freezer dry. Um, so what the object of the game with that is to make the mold go dormant. So you want to reduce the moisture content in the object and in the mold itself. Essentially what we're doing is removing one of the components that makes the mold active, which is the moisture. So you know how you wrap things that go in the freezer to prevent freezer burn? Well, in here we're actually trying to make freezer burn happen in a way, because freezer burn is actually when moisture is being pulled out of the food and it dries up. So if you're doing books, for example, you want, don't want to wrap them tightly in tin foil or anything like that um, when you put them in the freezer. You want the books to get freezer burn, if that makes sense. Um, for other things, other collection items, like wooden objects, that sort of thing, I'm a book and paper conservator, so I'm there. that may not be the best method for all types of collections. So you want to check with protocols on how to freeze other objects safely um, because materials are going to behave differently. One of the links I put in to, um, to the resources is a link to um, museumpest.net, which is the Integrated Pest Management Working Group, that talks about different things 
<laughs> Freezing is easy in Alaska. We just set it outside. Actually, yeah, you probably could do that. <laughs> Does it get to be minus 10 to four, minus 40 Fahrenheit out there, though? Because you need to be really cold. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Really? Wow. It doesn't get that cold in Connecticut. Okay, then, yeah. And if you're in Alaska, put it outside. <laughs> just make sure that you can put it outside and make sure what kind of precautions you need to take to make sure that you're not going to damage your collection item. Because there are a lot of things that shouldn't be frozen, even if there is a mold outbreak. So there's a link that I've um, added that should um, tell you what things you can and cannot freeze. Yes, that's really cold. My goodness. Um, so yes, the colder the freezer, the better. Um, the equipment, and also in addition, the equipment should have the capacity to freeze very quickly. And as I mentioned, the temperatures must be around minus 10 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, in Alaska, uh, to facilitate drying. And at these very cold temperatures, mold will be killed due to ice crystals that form inside the spore and burst the cell wall of the spore. So you can do a double whammy. It may actually kill the mold and I'll make it go dormant and kill it. So to continue, the advantage for freeze dry or freezer dry, it's not expensive. It's good for damp paper-based objects and it buys time. You can leave it in the freezer for a, a long time um, in order to determine what next steps you need to take. The only drag is it actually takes a long time for, to ensure that the mold has gone dormant um, and ideally has been killed. Um, four months is the minimum we tell people to leave things in the freezer. And as I mentioned, it's not suitable for all objects. So you definitely want to check with a conservator before you go and um, freeze the object. And with some types of paper, the if it's damp, uh, the paper might stick together, especially coated papers like you find in art books. So for large incidences, um, what works really well to stop the growth is, again, we are trying to remove the moisture from the space. So dehumidification in place works really well. Again, object of the game is to make the mold go dormant by removing moisture so it can't, um, it can't germinate. Um, it, you don't have to move your collections if you do this kind of thing where you have created a containment and add, dehumidific uh, add dehumidifiers to the space. It works really well. Uh, and yes, it's basically hyped up air drying, essentially, or sped up air drying, I guess would be a better way of putting it. Um, and also, you're taking, uh, you're taking moisture out, so it really is, it's not really hyped up air drying. Never mind, I didn't say that. Uh, so if this is a water incident, um, as well as mold, um, this method won't stop inks from bleeding, coating paper, coated paper could stick, um, and you may have some distortion of objects. Uh, but you can also, um, for large incidents, if you don't, can't do the dehumidification in place, you can also do large scale vendor freezing where you pack out, have a vendor pack out the materials and put them in and put them in large scale freezers. You can uh, secure a vendor or a company with access to large freezers to take the, in the collections and freeze the items. Again, buys you time to make decisions. Um, and if you leave them there long enough, it will actually make the mold go dormant, um, provided you're able to leave it there that long and actually able to afford to pay to keep the items there that long. So kill the mold. In order to kill the mold, um, you could do this for small or large incidents. As I mentioned in the stop the growth slides, freezing at cold enough temperatures, Alaska temperatures, uh, will kill active mold spores. So what happens, as I mentioned, uh, what happens is that the water inside of the cell forms ice crystals, which cause the cell walls to burst, and thus, thus killing the spore. So this only works when the mold is active, as inactive mold doesn't have enough water content to form ice crystals, so it won't do you any good if the stuff is already dormant. But freezing is great, as I've mentioned, because it stops mold growth and it buys time for deciding what you need to do next. 
However, freezing can be problematic for many collection items. Um, a list of materials that should not be frozen are included in uh, the resources. There's a link to uh, low temperature uh, treatment options for insect infestations, which also includes a list of items that shouldn't be frozen. But there will be other stipulations, especially with water-soaked collections, such as wood or any sort of composite object. I highly recommend talking to an objects conservator uh, before going and freezing um, composite objects, uh, wooden objects, anything that isn't um, a book <laughs> or um, flat paper and photographs are also something that should be um, consulted about as well. So one of the best options for really large, for large incidents is vacuum freeze drying. What's awesome about this particular method is that it sublimates the moisture out of the collections. So you don't get a whole lot of distortion because the materials are frozen and then there's a lot of pressure that's applied to the chamber so that the ice turns instantly into a gas and it evaporates off. So it never gets to that water stage where you end up with bleeding inks or coated paper to stick. It's a really great method. Uh, it can, has to be done by a vendor. And once that vendor is done with the vacuum freeze drying portion of things, they can also clean the materials so that you're removing all the dormant and dead mold spores from the objects. It works great for large outbreaks in our libraries and archives. I've used it many times. Um, for water incidences in variety of um, in a variety of space in a variety of um, institutions, and it's a really it's a really great thing that works really well. Um, it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. It sort of depends on the volume, and I'd have to look up what the average cost was. Last I checked, and I can't recall off the top of my head. So that's something I can look up if anyone is interested in knowing. And here's the caveat, <laughs> killing mold, what doesn't work? Um, there's a lot of different things that people have touted as things that would work that for killing mold. So I'm going to be here, to, I'm here to dispel the myth of some of these uh, household methods. So um, sunlight, often people say will kill mold. Well, the thing about the sun is it's probably either drying out the mold because it's removing the moisture, basically desiccating the object, or it could be the ultraviolet light from the sun that's killing the mold. And as you probably learned from Gretchen's lecture about the 10 agents of deterioration, light is one enemy of collections as it causes fading and discoloration. So it's something we really don't actually want to use. And also, if you remember the mold colors we saw in previous slides, that pigmentation is there for some types of mold to help it survive things like UV light. And while UV ultraviolet light will kill some types of mold, it's not going to be a cure-all for all molds. Uh, so unless you're going to test the mold to find out what kind of um, what kind of, unless you're going to test to find out what kind of mold it is, um, you're just better off not using the sun. Lysol. So Lysol kills lots of bacteria and viruses, but it does not kill mold. It's a fungistat. It only inhibits mold growth. So, and besides, you shouldn't be spraying Lysol on your collections, though people have asked me before about things. And no, please don't spray Lysol on your collections. Uh, bleach, there's in all varieties, whether it's the chlorinated variety or the um, oxidative or hydrogen peroxide variety. Uh, chlorinated bleach does kill mold, but some molds actually are resistant to it. Again, it's not something that you want to use to clean your collections. You can use it in your bathroom and you can use it to bleach your sheets, but don't use it to clean collections. And alcohol. So alcohols on their own, straight alcohols are not going to kill mold. In fact, there are some solvents, including some alcohols, that actually reactivate certain molds. So moral of the story is don't use any chemicals to clean collections. OK, you got that? Great. That's awesome. <laughs>
Okay, now that we've killed the mold or made it go to sleep, it's time to remove it. So as I've mentioned throughout the lecture multiple times, um, removal of mold is key to stopping mold growth and to keep incidents from reoccurring. So the inactive mold will need to be removed from collections to ensure they're safe to use again, um, to, as well as to prevent reinfestation. So once mold is inactive, it can be carefully cleaned off collection materials, either using a soft brush to direct the mold into the nozzle of the vacuum or through a screen or cheesecloth. They also make vacuums that have variable suction. So um, what you can do is determine how, um, how much suction is being pulled on the vacuum, and you can have these little tools attached that are called micro tools. You can attach it to the trunk, I guess that's the trunk, or the hose, excuse me, of the vacuum, and you can use that to clean collections. Um, the one I'm using here, I'm using the technique where, in the picture, where I'm sweeping the mold into the um, HEPA vac nozzle as I'm cleaning the mold off of the artwork on paper. So for non-porous materials, uh, vulcanized rubber sponges work very well. And I've put a link in your other resources to where you can get those kinds of uh, sponges. They work really well to clean mold. And ideally, you should be doing this kind of work in a fume hood or in an isolated space with negative air pressure, which is what I'm doing here in this particular picture. Um, you can also do it outside on a still sunny day. Um, try to do it in the shade so you're not bleaching out your collections uh, to reduce the spread, risk and spread of mold throughout the building. And especially, you should always assume that there's a health hazard around mold and make sure you wear your personal protective equipment. Um, and as you've seen in previous slides, mold can do physical damage to collections. So any in-house cleaning should be done carefully by staff wearing personal protective equipment and a knowledge of someone who knows how to carefully handle uh, materials and knows about careful handling techniques for fragile things. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, we can't expect miracles especially uh, when you look at the residual color components as some molds leave. When mold feeds, it often secretes these different pigments, and some, as, as I mentioned, some as a defense me mechanism to block light, um, and other colors come forth as an influence of whatever they're digesting. So mold staining is really tricky, and if it's something that's really defacing to an object, I would definitely consult a conservator about um, determining how they can get that, reduce that mold staining so that it's not as defacing. In some cases, if it's a modern book um, or something that's, you know, something that's actually replaceable, um, you may consider um, replacement as a viable option for some materials depending on the damage and how extensive it is. Okay, so for removing mold, I'm just going to have a slide, caveat slide about disaster recovery companies. Um, if you're working with a disaster recovery company, don't assume that they always know what's best for collections. Um, a lot of times, as I mentioned, I think in a previous slide, um, disaster recovery co uh, companies are used to working with home furnishings. They aren't necessarily work. They aren't necessarily used to working with irreplaceable collection, museum, object kind of things. Um, they'll want your business, so they'll try to gain your trust. It's really important that you ask a lot of questions, and if you aren't sure about their answers, you check with a conservator or another collection specialist who would know the, real, know the answer to that or be able to verify whatever they're telling you. The name of the company alone is not enough to assume reputation. Um, there are a lot of different name brand disaster recovery companies out there. What it, the thing about them is they're all independently owned and operated. While they're under one umbrella of one company, they may have their own procedures that they've brought from another company they've worked for. They may use those particular techniques because that's what they know. Um, and it's not necessarily 
just because the company overall believes that there's a certain way that we should be doing particular things like mold remediation, not everyone is going to follow those practices. You need to ask a lot of questions, <laughs> asking what they're planning on doing, what methods they're using. Um, they'll often talk about things like um, deodorizing collections, which you don't want, um, certain chemical treatments. There's a lot of other extras and offers they will add on top. Just don't assume that they know. When they say it's safe for collections, don't assume that they know. And if you need to get advice, you can ask a conservator for free by calling the AIC NHR Collections Emergency Hotline. Um, we will answer. I'm one of the people who staffs that hotline, and I have a lot of knowledgeable colleagues who do the same. And we are really good about making sure we get answers for people. If it not necessarily be right away, we definitely consult all of our colleagues in the National Heritage Responders Group to make sure that we can get the, a right answer for you. So uh, you definitely feel free to call that if you're in the middle of a situation where you're needing to get answers about what a disaster recovery company is promising. Um, I also did a webinar uh, that's been taped um, a year or two ago about working with disaster recovery companies, and I've linked it in the resources if you're interested in more information about that. So for preventing reinfestation, you need to clean the whole space. And that's cleaning with a HEPA vacuum, a soot sponge or the vulcanized rubber sponge that I mentioned. And if necessary, you can wipe down shelving, other inert, um, or wiping down shelving or other things that are metal and not collections. You can use a solution of one cup of bleach per one gallon of water to clean and you want to dry it thoroughly after you've wiped it down. You want to replace any carpet, padding, furniture, wallboard that was moldy. Um, repair or replace any equipment or plumbing that may have caused the problem. And begin an environmental monitoring program. There are um, a lot of different choices for data loggers out there that are really helpful for um, tracking your temperature and relative humidity in spaces, and it's a really great way to keep track of what your what the conditions are in your space and if you can catch things early enough in terms of rising uh, relative humidities that sort of thing it's really really helpful um, one particular data logger that i like is the pem2 from image permanence institute they have excellent analytical software called the climate notebook that is really wonderful in um, making sure that you Ah, there are many connections to collections, care webinars, and environmental monitoring and data loggers. That's excellent. So yes, I encourage you to go check that out if you would like to go data logger shopping. Yes, thanks, Susan. So, in summary, mold needs organics and moisture to survive and thrive. Mold can be active or inactive depending on the environment. Protect yourself from mold. Protective. Pro Personal protective equipment is a must. And it says the four steps to mold at response, but it's really five. Isolate the outbreak, stop the growth, kill the mold, or at least make it go dormant, remove the mold, and prevent reinfestation. And that, my friends, is the end of my uh, class lecture. I see that there's some questions in the parking lot, so I'm happy to answer that in any else. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question is mine. What type of freezers can be used for freezing materials? Can someone just, uh, you know, take materials and freeze them in their home freezers? Or do um, you need to have a freezer that's dedicated? What kinds of things should you look so, for? Most of the time, people usually buy chest freezers that can get cold enough. Um, you want to be able to get to those minus 10 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit temperature to get the most benefit out of um, freezer drying. So you can, depending, you'd have to determine like your existing freezer to see if it actually can get that cold. I don't know if freezers that are connected to refrigerators actually can get that cold. I think it's usually a chest freezer. 
Um, th there's also, uh, if people are interested, and there's a link uh, in our resources on the Connecting to Collections Care website to a, um, a resource from the National Park Service on, on cold storage and freezing. So take a well, look. Was a conservagram? Um, it's more than a conservagram. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll also post that link in the handout. Cool. Um, okay. Um, and Lexi Eckelman uh, said, what if you have an object that's too large to freeze? Um, how can you kill that? <laughs> Um, that is a good question. Um, something like that, I would think that you would probably want to consult a conservator that's in that particular specialty. Um, so there are some solvent combinations that will actually kill mold that I haven't talked about here, um, just because I don't need people mixing different things together to actually, um, create solutions that they're going to use on their collections. But conservators are knowledgeable in chemistry, so they're able to actually utilize solvents like this to do that. So there may be a solution that it would be literally, ha -ha, solution, ha -ha. Um, literally and figuratively to taking care of larger objects, but I would consult a conservator. Okay, Lexi's, she says, but, uh, Denatured alcohol wouldn't work. I think we used it, used that, so I So the thing about denatured alcohol so. is that they add different other components to make it um, not drinkable, right? So it's ethanol with methanol and other solvents that are added so that you don't think it's ever, ever clear. Some of those other solvents actually can reactivate dormant mold. So that's, and this is partially why I'm telling people not to use particular chemicals because it's just not, it's because it, you don't necessarily have the chemistry or um, experience to know what solvents are okay and what solvents may reactivate. So, yeah. That's. Yeah. Um, so Amanda Richard says, um, what about a powder coated bookshelf like bookshelving? Um, can you just use the 50 50 bleach yep, for that? That's fine. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And let's see, Gretchen is typing okay. something. Um, About 90% of alcohol for which you need a permit for. Um, this is, it's interesting, actually, because <laughs> um, we've been having this discussion about what type of ethanol or ethyl alcohol should be used in conservation land to kill mold. I've heard 70% ethyl alcohol. I've heard 90% from Gretchen. Um, I've heard that isopropyl alcohol more readily than ethyl alcohol. So I'm actually going to be doing an article on this so that we can actually come to a conclusion, at least by, I'm going to do a lot of information gathering to figure out what is actually a definitive a definitive answer? Yes, it is expensive. I just buy Everclear. If you're gonna need, if you need like, yeah, yeah. I because you need a permit and all that jazz. If you're gonna buy it. Yeah, I know what. When I was in grad school, we used to be able to buy pure alcohol in the state store in um, in Pennsylvania, yep. but um, we needed a special permit and. Um, I know you can't buy it. No, everywhere. you can't. And I know that even as recently as 2014, they were using, um, they were buying ethyl alcohol, like 70% ethyl alcohol, I think, in the drugstore. Is, what was it? Was that Superstorm Sandy? Or Harvey? It was one of the, they were using, buying it at the um, drugstore, and now you can't even get that anymore. And that was only like five years ago. So. Right. Right. Um, so are there any other questions while well, people are thinking about if they have any other questions? I just want to go over um, again about the assignment. So um, Tara's assignment this week is a quiz. So you can do the quiz, and if you pass the quiz, um, then you'll get a pass on that. 
I know a lot of people are still working on last week's assignment, and that's fine. You have until November 8th to get everything done. But please make sure that you put the assignments in the week where they belong. Um, otherwise, we have a problem with it, but um, it's a problem that's solvable. I'd just rather not. And with your your assignments for last week, if you can collect all your images and stuff into one document, and um, you can either make a reduced size PDF and you can post it, or you can post it as a Word document, depending on the size. And if you have trouble with them, let me know, uh, and I'll try and help solve it. But uh, making a reduced size PDF uh, seems to have solved a lot of people's problems, so um, try that. And remember that in order to get your Credly badge for this, you need to listen to all the webinars, and you have to listen to them in order. So, um, and and you need to do all these assignments and have them in by November 8th. Okay, so it doesn't look like there are any other questions. Oh. So I think we're done. Okay, you guys get out of class early. Yeah. Okay, you guys get out of class early. <laughs> yeah, I, and wait, a couple of people are typing. Oh, okay. Um, oh, they're just saying thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you for telling me who the head of the Chakora Foundation yeah. is, Sharon. The Chakora Foundation is, Sharon. Yeah. We'll see if there are any more questions. But um, so, Tara, I I I just I want to go back to this sure. freezer thing. So if you yeah. had if you have a home freezer, but a home locker freezer, yes. that would work. That should. If you can um, get the, if you can get it cold enough, that should totally okay. work. Okay. And does it matter if it has food in it? Mm. Yeah, I, uh, what I'm asking is, do you need a dedicated freezer? I think that would be best. Um, <laughs> yeah, and what about um, if you had a problem, could you go to your local grocery store or Costco or someplace with a large freezer and ask them if they will provide you with some space temporarily? If you have an emergency plan, you should already have a list of vendors that would be able to provide these kinds of resources. So that's something that you can, um, if you want to go back to your emergency plan, if that's something you don't have, that would be something that you can add to, um, so you have that option. Right, okay. So update your emergency plans. <laughs> yeah. And Gretchen says, I would avoid food places because it talks it talks Yeah, I'm pretty sure exactly. that they would probably yeah. be running the other way. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So I think that's it. Next week is our last um, uh, session in this series, and we will have um, <clears throat> we'll have Paul. Um, oh my God. Storage. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to have this great fellow. Yeah, Paul Storage. No problem. Thank you. Um, and he will. No he will be here. He's from Minnesota. He He's terrific. He works with small institutions all over the state of Minnesota, and I think you'll really like him. And so just keep working on your stuff. If you have problems, let us know. And thank you, Tara.